Hi all, welcome to the fourth in our series of revision lectures on what a massive surprise topic for, which is chemical bonding and structure. So we're going to start with ionic bonding and structures of ionic compounds. And this is what our um, study guide looks like. So we talk about ions in general, talk about the link between ions and electron config, then ionic structures, um, naming ionic compounds, physical properties of ionic compounds, which links into those, I'm not going to go through specifically the list of um, complex ions you need to know, but you should know that list just off the top of your head. Okay. So cation and anion formation. So let's look at pen lithium as an example. So lithium has two in its S, one S and then one here. And then fluorine has two and then seven. So the holy grail, if you are an element, is to get a full outer shell which resembles a noble gas. So if you're something like lithium, the easiest way for you to get a full outer shell is to lose an electron. If you're a non-metal like fluorine, the easiest way for you to get a full electron shell is to take an electron. So once lithium donates that electron, it has a positive charge. Once fluorine acquires that electron, it gains a negative charge. Non-metals, form anions and metals form cations. Okay, let's continue. So I did largely cover this in the other slide, but if your goal is to be a noble gas, If you are a non-metal, if you're one of these guys, you're going to gain electrons. If you are a metal, you're going to lose electrons. Now, just keep in mind if you're a metal that's all the way over here, like if you're gold, you're not going to be able to gain, you're not going to be able to lose enough electrons to get a full outer shell. So that's why we see, as in the periodicity, this is why we see those variable states through this D block, because it's not feasible for them to lose enough electrons for them to form that um, noble gas electron structure. So just remember, it is all about, wrong thing, it is all about getting a noble gas electron config and whatever the easiest way it is for you to do that. <coughs> okay. So if we have... Oh, better change to my pen. Ionic substances. So you've got some positively charged metal ions and some negatively charged, and I'm sorry for anybody who's colorblind, and some negatively charged anions or non metal. The attraction that they have between them is called an electrostatic. 
So that is an electrostatic attraction. And this overall alternating structure is called an ionic lattice. So those alternating positive and negative ions form an ionic lattice. And this lattice explains pretty much all of the properties of ionic substances, which I believe are on the next slide. So properties of ionic compounds. So ionic compounds shatter. They're not malleable. A lot of them can dissolve in water. So they don't conduct electricity when they're solid. <coughs> Do when liquid or aqueous. And all of that comes down to the fact that these things have those have that ionic lattice structure that we just saw on the previous page so if i were to hit this with a hammer and move this last row of ions down one so that would be a minus, this would be a plus, that would be a minus. These would then pell each other and my lattice would break. That's why it shatters. Because my water is a polar molecule, if I've got my negatively charged, my partial negative, <coughs> sorry, if I have my partial negative oxygen here, it can actually form an attraction and pull that positive charge out of the lattice. So some of these are soluble, but it comes down to the strength of the attraction here. The stronger the attraction here, the less likely it is to be soluble in water. They don't conduct electricity when solid. So in order for something to conduct electricity, I need particles that are moving and charged. In a solid, yes, I have charged particles, but they're not moving. But when I make that a liquid or an, a an aqueous, Again, to conduct electricity, I need particles that are moving and charged. When it's in liquid or aqueous form, yes, those particles are moving and yes, they're charged. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Excuse me. Okay, so in terms of volatility, remembering that we've got these quite strong electrostatic forces. Now, because those forces are quite strong, it takes quite a lot of energy to break those bonds apart, which means that we're looking at really quite high melting points and boiling points. So something like lead bromide can be done with a particular attachment to a Bunsen burner, but it couldn't be done in just a standard oven. So these have quite low volatility because of those high melting and boiling points, because of those strong electrostatic forces holding the lattice together. So let's continue on and talk about covalent bonding. So covalent bonds are formed Again, electrostatic attraction, sharing electrons. Single, double and triple, length and strength, polarity. 
Yes, yes, and yes. Okay. So, what is a covalent bond? Covalent bonds are formed by sharing of electrons. So, for example, if I've got a hydrogen atom that has one electron in its outer shell and another hydrogen atom with an electron in its outer shell, this hydrogen atom is now exposed to two electrons, which gives it an electron config that looks like heliums. So again, the goal is to get a full outer shell. It's still to look like a noble gas, but covalent bonds are where you get that full outer shell by sharing electrons rather than stealing an electron or giving away an electron. So for single, double and triple bonds, I am just going to look at carbon. So carbon has four electrons in its outer shell that are able to be bonded to. So for something like methane, it has four single bonds, one to each of those hydrogen atoms. Double is where instead of sharing one pair of electrons, it shares two pair of electrons to form ethene. But carbon can equally share three pairs of electrons. Each one of these lines, oh, that's the wrong highlighter color. Each of these pairs, each, sorry, each of these lines Sorry, I keep uh, green. So a line is equal to one pair electrons. <coughs> okay. So when you look at, let's compare ethene. to ethine. I don't know why I keep drawing it up at that angle. When you actually, and if you've got your data book there, you should be able to tell, this is a longer bond than this is. The length of a bond is actually this physical distance between So the shorter the bond, it, the stronger it is. So a single bond is longer than a double bond is longer than a triple bond. So the shorter that bond is, the closer those two atoms are, the stronger the bond is between them. All of that is in the data book. There are two tables on pages next to each other. One of them has the bond lengths and the other one has the bond strengths. But yeah, that's the basic takeaway. The shorter the bond, the stronger it is. So bond polarity goes back to electronegativity, which we talked about in the previous presentation. So have I talked about electronegativity? Yes, I did in the context of periodicity. So electronegativity, when we're talking about bond polarities, let's look at water. Now, as I said in that previous video, in this bond, the two electrons are not evenly distributed. So they will spend more time with the oxygen than they do with the hydrogen. That comes down to a difference in electronegativity. The electronegativities are given in the data booklet. But if you remember from looking at our periodic table, it's this top corner here where I've got high electronegativities. 
So bond polarity is just showing that the electrons are not evenly distributed throughout this covalent bond. Okay. So covalent structures we can talk about in a variety of different ways. So we've got Lewis structures, octet rules, incomplete octets, resonance, Vespa, carbon and silicon. Deducing Lewis structures using Vespa, using bond, so predicting bond angles, using the bond angles with molecular polarity to work at, sorry, using bond angles and bond polarity to work at molecular polarity and resonance structures. Okay, so, okay, so Lewis structures are one of the main ways that we can represent covalent compounds. The thing that is super important to remember, let's look at ammonia. Make sure that you are representing the lone pair of electrons. That is the most common mistake that people make. You can represent the electrons all as dots. So the bonding pairs of electrons, you can represent all of the electron pairs as lines. You can use X's. It's completely up to you as long as you are, and again, it is the simplest mistake to make with these, make sure you're representing the lone pair. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Sorry about that. So the octet rule. So with the exception of hydrogen and helium, all of the elements, sorry, all of the compounds, sorry, all of the atoms that we look at. So let's look at <clears throat> methane, ammonia, and water. So how many electrons is my carbon atom associated with? It's associated with two in that bond, two, two, and two. That makes eight electrons all up. What about my nitrogen? Two, four, six, eight. What about my water? Two, four, six, eight. So this, sorry, just going to my pen. The fact that we see this repeating eight, this is our octet rule. Although we are just about to discuss that it's more of a guideline than an actual rule. Um, so let's continue. Okay, so we've just talked about the octet rule, which is making sure that that <clears throat> central atom has eight electrons surrounding it. There's two exceptions that can have what are called incomplete octets, and those are beryllium and boron. So beryllium, So beryllium chloride is BeCl2 and obviously my beryllium in the middle does not have um, a full octet and boron, boric chloride, however you would pronounce that, that also has an incomplete octet. In HL we are going to talk about what's called an expanded octet as well but for SL you only need to know about incomplete. 
So you need to know that these are our exceptions, so beryllium and boron. It largely comes down to it being a function of these atoms being so small. <coughs> the uh, um, electrons are so close in and it makes these slightly more stable than you'd expect. So resonance is basically the idea that we can have atoms arranged in a particular way, but their electrons aren't fixed. So the obvious example here is benzene. And benzene can and does flicker between these two forms. So all of my carbon and hydrogen atoms are in the same place, but my electrons are able to move between those two forms. So that's what a resonance structure is. So So normally if we were talking about electrons moving, we'd be talking about breaking or forming bonds. But in the case of resonance, it's more complicated than that. So instead of either of these structures really being correct, the most accurate structure for what benzene looks like is this, where that second electron in those double bonds is delocalized and resonates around um, the structure. So resonance is where I can show two Lewis structures for the same molecule. Now, most, so this, here represents our delocalized. But th these individual things are our resonance structures. Okay, so I know I've been calling this Vespa, but it is in fact the CEPA. It is the valence, it would be good if I could spell, valence shell electron electron pair repulsion. So it's basically this idea that if I've got two things of the same charge, they're going to repel each other. And that goes for electron pairs. So when I'm deciding what shape a molecule has, for example, in my methane molecule, all of my electron pairs are not all going to be over the same side of the molecule because these would all repel each other. That's what Vespa says. And I'm going to keep calling it Vespa just because the CEPA sounds weird. <coughs> okay. <clears throat> So the basic upshot of electrons not liking each other is that, for example, with methane, when it forms a molecule, those, ele those electron pairs in the bonds are going to be as far apart as they can be. And I know it doesn't look like it in my drawing, but that is meant to be quite a dodgy 3D representation. So, for example, with um, carbon dioxide, so oxygen, carbon, oxygen, lone pairs. Always remember the lone pairs. Those are as far apart as they can be. There is a fantastic table in your textbook that takes you through all of the different um, electron domains and then molecular geometries. So, but basically, electrons want to be as far apart as possible and molecule shapes reflect that. where that can get a little bit tricky. And let's go back to 
methane, ammonia, and water, where that gets a little bit tricky is that the bond angle, the amount of space that's taken up by a bond is smaller than the amount of space taken up by a lone pair. So the bond angle with something like methane, so this purple angle I've just drawn here, sorry, this has a bond angle of 109.5 degrees. And yes, you are expected to know this number. When I've got my lone pair though, this bond angle decreases slightly. So when you're looking at something like this, it's going to be less than 109.5. And this angle is going to be smaller than, smaller than 109.5. You don't need to know exact numbers. I think the table in your book does give you exact numbers, but this is about 107. And this is about 105. Okay, now these bond angles, remember it is because of the fact that the lone pair takes up more room than, the, um, than a bonded pair of electrons. Okay, so silicon. Silicon is... Slightly different. Silicon does something different to um, other covalent compounds in that it forms networks. So silicon dioxide is SiO2. It is a covalent compound. So it can be found in this disordered state which is sand, or if I melt it down and then form it into glass, what ends up happening is I end up getting this repeating tetrahedral arrangement. Um, hang on. Give me just a second. Okay, so, sorry about that pause there, guys. Um, <clears throat> silicon dioxide forms this big, chunky network. So it's covalently bonded, which means it's got an incredibly high melting point and boiling point. Because every single one of these bonds shown here in this structure are covalent. So if, if I'm going to convert this into a liquid or a gaseous state, I need to split apart all of those covalent bonds, which are incredibly strong. So <clears throat> it's because the reason it's got this particular structure is a lot. Remember that these guys have a lot of the time those lone pairs of electrons, which is why we see the kinks in these structures. <coughs> so because it's all covalently bonded, it's not soluble in water. And it doesn't conduct electricity. And again, that's about being a solid more than anything else. In molten, yes, it can, but let's just talk about the solids for now. So glass is actually a reasonable electrical insulator. So we then go on to our allotropes of carbon. 
So allotropes are um, different forms of the same element. So for example, one of the forms of carbon that you're used to seeing is diamond, which is a big covalent network lattice. Now, you, you guys know the properties of diamonds. All of that comes back to the fact that it is this large covalent network. Those covalent bonds make it incredibly strong. And basically, it takes so much energy to break apart a diamond that it effectively um, sublimes. Okay, you've then got graphite and graphene. Which are effectively the same structure except graphene's bigger. So what graphite and graphene look like are a series of hexagons all, oh, all in a layer. Graphite and graphene are flat. Now what's important, if I think about my carbon atom here, it's only attached to one to three others, which means that it has one electron that's delocalized. That makes these able to conduct electricity. So graphite and in particular graphene these are really interesting for things like technology because of those delocalized electrons they're able to carry an electric current which yeah makes them really interesting the last one and i think i remember last year actually showing you a picture of some of buckminster fuller's um domes so they're called fullerenes and they come in two forms. They're C50 and C60, 60, and they look like soccer balls. So they're hexagonal and pentagonal rings. They look like um, so soccer balls. So they can be found, it isn't C60, sorry, it's C70. I thought it was 50 for some reason, my apologies. So there's fullerenes, which look like footballs or soccer balls, depending on where you're from in the world. Now, these fullerenes um, can be found by vaporising carbon. But when you look at bucky balls, and I am just going to draw them as spheres, this is one molecule and this is another one. This is not one molecule of Buck Buckminster fullerene. This, however, is one molecule of graphite or graphene, even if I keep expanding it out. So my individual soccer balls are each, um, a buck, are each a fuller ring. So there's only in between these, only LDF, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment. So I call them bucky balls. They're technically called Buckminster fuller ring or just fuller rings. But diamond, graphite, graphene, and fuller rings are the main types of, um, carbon that we need to know about. There is also coal, which is an amorphous form of carbon, usually with some hydrogen in it and sometimes some sulphur. 
Okay, so if you're looking at overall molecular polarity, which is what determines or what we're going to look at with um, dipole-dipole bonding, you need to take two things into, into mind. You need bond polarity and you need the molecule shape to be right. So bond polarity, remember you're talking about that difference in electronegativities and you can get those out of the data book and then the molecule shape you will often need to determine that. So for example if you're looking at something like methane, yes it has that bond polarity but those bonds, that bond polarity is pulling equally in all directions. So the molecule shape doesn't support it being an overall polar molecule. So this is non-polar. However, exactly the same molecule shape, but let's look at ammonia. So all of these are polar bonds, but overall this leads to a negative end and a positive end. So this is a polar molecule. I will give you some more practice with this, but remember, just like when we're conducting electricity, we need particles that are moving and charged. For me to have an overall polar molecule, I need a difference in electronegativity and I need an asymmetrical. And I'm pretty sure I haven't spelt that right, but I can't be bothered looking it up. Okay, so let's look at intermolecular forces. So we've got <coughs> the different types of intermolecular force and their relative strengths, working out the type of intermolecular force, explaining the different properties of covalent compounds. And yeah, let's continue. So LDF, the other way we can talk about that is instantaneous. So for example, if I have a, an atom, because it's a noble gas of xenon, because electrons move randomly, I know they don't quite move randomly, but randomly enough. At any one time, it would be possible for more of the electrons to be on one side of the atom than the other. And that would lead to, in that second, this side of the molecule having a s atom having a slightly negative charge and this side of the molecule having a slightly positive charge. So LDF are all about those random distributions of electrons being at any one second slightly less, so slightly less evenly distributed. So LDFs are weak. So they're for non-polar, non-ionic substances. <coughs> and if I increase the number of electrons, I increase the force of the LDF. So this is why something like methane has a lower melting and boiling point than something like butane. <coughs> okay. So dipole-dipole interactions um, are, oh dear Lord, sorry, my, I just went blank for a moment. So dipole-dipole interactions are when you've got something like hydrogen chloride and so this has a slightly positive charge and this has a slightly negative charge. What happens in a sample of hydrogen chloride gas if I've got another HCl over here? And again, that's got those positive and negative charges. I'm going to get an attraction here and an attraction here. Those are still electrostatic attractions. 
and that's a dipole dipole interaction um, let me just get my pen so it's stronger than the LDF we just looked at but it isn't as strong as the H bonding we're about to look up. Okay. Hydrogen bonding are formed when you've got a hydrogen attached to, the way I remember it, is phon. So if I've got a hydrogen attached to a fluorine, a hydrogen attached to an oxygen, or a hydrogen attached to a nitrogen, of course, that molecule, hydrogen fluoride, is now complete, whereas oxygen and nitrogen can continue on and be bonded to other things. So when we're doing organic, we can talk about hydrogen bonding existing between molecules of ethanol. <coughs> because this has a slightly positive and this has a slightly negative. And that slightly positive and slightly negative are stronger than, there's a larger difference in electronegativity which means that these partial charges are larger, which means that that intermolecular force is greater. One important thing to note, because it is something that students will consistently mix up, this is not the hydrogen bond. The hydrogen bond is the attractive force between, and I'm just going to switch to water, The hydrogen bond is the attractive force between my slightly, sorry, it is this attraction here between that slightly negative oxygen and that slightly positive hydrogen. This is why water has such a messed up melting point for a molecule of its size. Molecules of water's size generally don't have melting points as high as water does. So I'm hoping you all know at this point that water has a melting point of zero degrees Celsius. I'm hoping that's not a surprise. Now look at its molecular mass. So it's approximately 18. That's approximately. Methane, on the other hand, has a melting point of, methane, however, has a melting point of negative 182 degrees Celsius. Okay, so as I've been talking throughout this part of the presentation, you've hopefully worked out the rough order of these. So it starts with those LDF, those instantaneous dipoles, We've then got dipole, dipole. Then we have H bonds. And basically, we move from weak to strong along here. <coughs> okay. Okay, and lucky last, we've got metallic bonding. So we're going to talk about what a metallic bond is, what the strength of it depends on, and what alloys are about. We're going to explain the link between lattices and um, the trends that we see. We're only going to be talking about S&P block in terms of reactivity trends. Okay, so... A metallic bond looks like, so metals react by giving up their electrons. But what happens if I've got a whole bunch of metal atoms together? Where do they give their electrons up to? That's how a metallic, oh, metallic 
lattice works. I've got all of my positive metal ions nice and neatly arranged. Then I've got delocalized electrons that wander. So you end up with a sea of delocalized electrons. So they're not in a fixed location, they're able to move around. So that is our metallic bond. It's this electrostatic attraction between these fixed, these located cations and these delocalized electrons. So the strength of a lattice is basically dependent on what's the metal. So, so in terms of like ionic radius. Because if those ions are able to pack closer together, if the electrons are able to hold them tighter together, it's going to be harder for us to move it. So in terms of ionic radius and in terms of the number of delocalized electrons. So if I've got something with that's a two plus, it's donated two electrons. So if I compare, say, sodium metal to magnesium metal, those two ions are roughly the same size, but because magnesium's donated two electrons and sodium's only donated one, it's a much tighter, um, it's a much stronger lattice. So alloys are where we have, doo -doo. sorry, I'm just going to have to draw this quickly. It's where instead of just having one metal in my metallic lattice, I might have two. So this is called a um, interstitial lattice. No, this is a substitution alloy. You don't have to know about interstitial alloys, but some alloys include things like brass, which is a copper zinc alloy. You've then got steel. Um, <coughs> and then you've probably never heard of this, but your parents might have them. Some people have what are called amalgam fillings, which is a mercury and silver. Um, there's then solder, which is a lead um, alloy, which is used to be used for putting together window panes in lead lighting. That's why they're called lead lights. <clears throat> now, what doing this to my lattice does is it changes the properties of this lattice which I'm about to talk about in a moment but if I'm trying to move these two layers past each other having this big larger chunkier cation in there will change how these two layers interact with each other it will change how easily my electrons can wander through by changing some of the elements that are in this lattice, I change its electrical conductivity. I change the ability to actually physically change the shape of this lattice for malleability as well. Okay, so the basic metallic properties that you need to know about and need to be able to link to um, our... I'm sorry, be, need to be able to link to the shape of that metallic lattice are uh, um, electrical conductivity,
you need to be able to explain malleability. <coughs> um, <clears throat> sorry. And those are really the two main ones, but the other properties that our metals have are what is called ductility, which is very closely linked to malleability. You've then got heat conductivity. Is that actually drawn there? What? How weird. So heat conductivity. which is very closely linked to why it's electrically conductive. And then the last one is lustrous. So metals are shiny, which I don't think that's quite the technical term, but for our purposes, shiny will do. And it's also got me stuck in Moana in my head, which is a nice plus. Okay, so I've got my metallic lattice. Now, because if you remember back to this very similar drawing that I did for my ionic lattice, when I shifted any of these rows, they ended up against something um, that had the same charge. So that's why my lattice shattered. These guys are floating like croutons in a soup. So these things can move past each other as long as they've got that soup of electrons to help them move around. So you can take a sheet of aluminium foil and you can bend it and you can shape it because those electrons in those in that in that um, aluminium lattice are able to move around and take, um, make changes. So if you remember back, electrical conductivity needed moving charged particles. So these particles, the electrons are moving and they're charged. So I can apply an electrical current through a metallic wire, which is pretty much exactly how I'm making this presentation right now and exactly how you're watching this presentation. Again, it comes down to the fact that I have these delocalized electrons. It is not down to the cations. It's all about those electrons. Okay, that brings us to the end of this topic four presentation. I will get some question bank questions for us to have a look at. Thank you so much for your attention. I know this has been a long one. Have a great rest of your day and I'll see you next time. Bye.